All right, uh, formed through suffering. Josh, I'll try to pay, pay attention to the slides so you can turn them. But we're talking about formed through suffering. What a topic tonight. And, uh, you know, we've talked about many disciplines and many practices. And I've been so blessed, by the way, uh, by this, uh, this journey with you. But we've talked about so many different practices that Christ uses to form us. But there's this very painful place. There's this very painful place where God seems to do this work most. And that, that is the, the place of suffering. And that, uh, if I can just slow down for a minute, we're just very real uh, tonight. How many of you, if you have children, if you saw one of your uh, children suffering and you could stop it, you would stop it? And so when we think about God as Father and we think about suffering, it, it's, a, it's paradoxical, if you will. It, it's a very hard thing to understand, and certainly why, why does he form us through suffering? I know I've had a conversation with God many a time where I've given him so many different options that he can use to transform me. He, he does not listen to that conversation very well, but it's just it's so cryptic to me and mysterious um, that I just want to lean in a little bit tonight. And let me just say from the get-go, some of the most complex theological and philosophical questions that humans have ever wrestled with are around suffering. And not just suffering, but why, if there's a God, do humans suffer? And I am not going to try to exhaust all of that tonight. We're going to try to stay in this vein right here, and that is, how does God form us through suffering? And that, that's going to be a difficult enough task tonight. So... Your mind is going to race naturally. You're going to have questions tonight about suffering. Rafe and I will do a Q&A at the end. We'll do our best. This is one of the most cryptic, uh, most deep, most vast subjects I know of. Know that I'm only going after this tonight. And so once again, I only want to look at how God uses suffering to form our souls. And here's why. So we can properly respond to suffering in our lives. That's what I'm after tonight. I want to learn how to properly respond to suffering. And if you could learn with me how to respond to suffering tonight, because we cannot rip the chapter out of our book of life. We can't. So we've got to find a, we, we, have, we have to find out what to do with suffering if we can't remove suffering. And, and so let me just give you some preliminary mar remarks, and then we're going, to, we're going to go to James chapter 1 in just a minute. But let's talk about the reality of suffering, guys. Let's be very raw and real tonight. To suffer is the most disorienting experience of a human life. It's a foreign experience that is not designed for this world. It does not belong here. Think about God's design of creation and the experience of a human being with God. This is a foreign power to us. What's, what's more, suffering is disorienting because it calls out to the spiritual world where our God dwells. It's this human experience down here, this very physical, spiritual, emotional experience that we're being crushed under its weight, but then we call on this God who is Father, who is of the spiritual world, and it just kind of creates this radical collision of two worlds. We rationalize our way through suffering. Why do I suffer? And that collides with this supernatural God whose, whose mind surpasses ours, obviously, infinitely. Suffering is a mystery. Let me just lay that out for us tonight. Suffering is a mystery. Suffering is a mystery. And so we, we come into that, that grand collision of suffering and God in James chapter 1. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 2. I have often argued with James reading verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, which is to say this is a birthright to those who know Jesus. What he's about to say can only happen through the Spirit. But I want to finish that verse for James. He needs some help apparently. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when, but look at what he says, when you meet trials of various kinds, not just one trial, for every season of life, for every human being, there, there, is, there is a different trial assigned to us that we go through. 
So when he says, count it all joy, what James is saying is that there's, mis there's mystery and suffering. God is working in hiddenness within our suffering, or he would never exhort us to count it all joy. There's some, there's some mystery embedded in the suffering. There, there's something happening that can release a joy. And that, that, is, that is cryptic language. And so he goes on to say, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So we see that emerging from suffering, if we learn how to respond to it correctly, is this steadfastness, this assurance of your salvation. If you've ever suffered greatly, and yet you have clung to God, you've, you've not walked away from God, you have exalted Jesus with tear-stained tear cheeks, and you've come through the other end of that trial still clinging to God as sovereign and king over you. It affirms that you're born again. That's what James is saying. It is testing our faith and not proving that we're saved to God. God knows. But it's affirming to our own souls that we are in the faith. But it also produces this muscle mass, this steadfastness. He says that uh, we are tested in, in suffering, in trials, tested. And I know you've heard this in a sermon or ten, but that word test, to test means to find impurities or cl in clay or in metal or whatever. And so we see right away that embedded in this mysterious call of suffering is this refining. It's this transformative work, which is our class. We can say that God somehow uses our suffering to form us. And we've got to figure out what that looks like. And I hope right now you're thinking about some, some very, very deep wounds that you've experienced. Not, not, not to live in those wounds, but I hope you're leaning in because you want to transform that experience into something that will form you. And so James goes on to say in verses 3 and 4, let, let it have its full effect. I mean, good, goodness, guys. How many of you, when you start to suffer, are just like, and by the way, let it have its full effect means to stay under its weight. How many of you guys work out? Watch this. Oh, okay, good. I thought everyone would be like, no, nah, I'm not, let's not mess with that tonight. You know, you know, you build muscle mass by staying under the weight, right? That's what they tell you? I don't know. I have no idea. I, yeah, those, those years are gone, if they were ever there. But you build muscle mass by staying under the weights. You tear the tissue of your muscles, and then that forms stronger muscles and bigger muscles, whatever. But that's, that's the analogy James is using. He goes like this. Stay under the weight of suffering because in the weight, by staying under that weight, Christ is being formed in you. Dude, when I start to suffer, I try to make a beeline out from the weight. So we can see that we have got to figure out what's going on here. And that's why I say, maybe suffering is the grandest, most powerful way that Jesus has formed in us. Maybe. So here's what I want to do tonight before we get to my one point that the Lord has put on my heart. I want to make a distinction between two things. This is very important for us tonight to lay this groundwork. I want to make a distinction between pain and suffering. And Josh, go ahead. Oh, wow, look at you. Look at you, my friend, looking at my notes. Yeah, very good, my friend. Very good. Um, this is very important for us to differentiate between pain and suffering. Pain and suffering, while intertwined and very closely related, guys, are not the same thing. And I think that's very important for you to understand your own story. I'm trying to help you, and I'm trying to help myself understand our own stories. I often say that person is in pain when they're not. They're in suffering. Here's, here's how we're going to differentiate between the two. I put just uh, a couple of small points at the bottom of the screen there. Pain tends to be external. And I, I don't want to get caught in the weeds here, guys, but I want you to understand what I'm trying to do here. Pain tends to be external. When you break a bone, you're in pain. When you're hungry, you're in pain. You have hunger pains. That's, that's an accurate, that's accurate la language. When you have a disease, you're in pain. And what's, what's interesting and why I believe this is very important to differentiate between pain and suffering is that you can be in pain and not suffer at all. I mean, athletes do it all the time. Some of you do it all the time. Like you are like working out and you're in absolute pain and you're like, dude, this is awesome. I love this. 
Like I legitimately start my mornings doing this. And I'm like, God bless you. God bless you. Go get them. <laughs> and so language is important to understand your own journey and story and where you're at with Jesus and how he's trying to enter into your story. Suffering, on the other hand. Suffering happens internally, guys. It's something that's happening in the soul. And I would even say it's an experience that cuts the deepest parts of the human heart. That's suffering. Suffering is felt when we experience a tear in the fabric of our life. Something is pulled apart inside of our hearts. That's suffering. The King James Bible calls it travail, heart pain, travail. So I want you to think about your story. Most of you, I'm, I'm assuming that all of us in this room, but, but some of you, like you, you live in, you've lived in suffering. My aim tonight is to put purpose in that suffering. I, I, I just want you to sit with that for a minute. It's not to hurt you or make you feel uncomfortable. It's so you begin to understand your story. It, it, we need to be able to say tonight that, yes, part of my story is a story of suffering. Okay? And I'll, I'll just put down a few, and I'm not here to drive a nail in. But when I say that suffering is when we experience a tear in the fabric of our hearts and our souls, here's what I mean. Suffering is shattered trust. Trust is one of the, the deepest bonds that two human beings can experience or a group of human beings can experience. And suffering is when that trust is shattered. Suffering is when identity is harmed. Like the very core of who you are is ripped away from you. Suffering is when love is taken away. I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even say this, but... We had a very dear friend, and we're going to end this night with joy, so just chill, right? But we had a very dear friend who was, who was 25 years old. Uh, she's, she was engaged to be married, died suddenly two weeks ago. And I watched, uh, I watched her fiancé. Oh, this sucks so bad. Put the wedding ring on her finger in her casket. That's suffering. Like, love was ripped away. Safety, safety stolen. You think of children. Purity robbed. Betrayal and abandonment. We go on and on. I don't want to. I'm happy tonight. But I want you to understand your story. That's suffering, guys. And I was reading a true story about an, Ara an Israeli woman who was in the Israeli military and a true story about suffering versus pain. She had her leg actually blown off. And uh, I quote her. She says, I was in deep distress with tears flooding over my face. The pain was nothing. But who would marry me now? That's suffering. Her identity was jarred and ripped. And yet what's so amazing about Scripture and God is Scripture does not silence the cry of the suffering. Scripture does not hide the suffering. And that's amazing about God because if I'm God, and goodness, what a stupid thing to say. If I'm God and there's, there's this confusion that if I'm a good God, then why do I allow, allow suffering? I'm probably not being this transparent with suffering in the Bible. But God is radically transparent about suffering souls in the Bible because he wants us to understand it. He wants, to, he wants us to understand it. Instead, God gives words to those who suffer. Let me show you something. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. 1 Chronicles chapter 4. I was sharing this with a dear saint today. And this dear saint said, John, I'm so happy that you're using the Old Testament. I was worried about you. <laughs> Every sermon you preach is out of the New Testament. Here we go. 
bathe in this. Here's what Scripture does. Scripture gives words to those who suffer, and I love this, you guys, because, again, I want you to understand that God loves you and God is in your story of suffering. Here's a man whose name is literally suffering. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9. If you blink, you will lose this man. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. The Hebrew word Jabez literally sounds like suffering. Like this guy's mom named him literally suffering or pain. Is that crazy? So obviously the birth was probably very violent and, and very dangerous, whatever, whatever. But look, at it didn't leave him there. It didn't leave him there. His journey was spotted. It was laced by suffering. Look at verse... Uh, Look at verse 10. Jabez called upon the God of Israel. So he's, he's grown now, and he calls upon the God of Israel. By the way, this is all that we know about this dude, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my borders, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. Like, there's a beauty in that, guys. My point is, I want you to see that God is not shying away from the suffering story. And that, that has caused so many a Christian to, to buckle in their walk with God. It's just like, God doesn't understand God. And I understand how crazy that is, guys. But I want you to grasp this just for a minute. I want to sit with this just for a minute. God wants to enter that story. I would even say that God is already in that story of suffering in your life. So here's what I want you to see as well. Here's a man whose name is suffering. But watch this. Here's a woman whose world is suffering. Look at Ruth chapter 1. Oh, our dear, dear Naomi. In Ruth chapter 1, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 19. Man, Naomi, Naomi's life is filled with suffering. She loses her whole family. Her whole family is wiped out. My wife right now, my wife works down at the Pacific Garden Mission, the homeless shelter downtown. <clears throat> and all of these refugees are coming up from South America and Central America. And my wife is ministering. My wife is probably tearing up right now. My wife is carrying this woman's burden right now, carrying her suffering. She came up with her husband on foot from South America, trying to get to the United States as a refugee. And her husband, trying to save another family on this journey, died. Like, this is recent. He's gone. And she carries on. She's pregnant with twins. And she loses the twins. And my wife says, she's just like, she sits there and weeps. And it's like, oh, what do you do with this? And this is what Naomi was going through. Look at Ruth, uh, chapter 1, verse 19. She's lost her family. So the two of them, that's Ruth and, and Naomi, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. Like, Naomi's back. Naomi's back. And the woman said, and the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, by the way, what does Naomi mean? Pleasant. Pleasant. She said to them, do not call me pleasant. Call me bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me pleasant when the Lord has testified against me? That is what happens to a precious life when you do not understand what God is doing with suffering. And it is not easy. And we could go on, write this text down. Scripture tells us, Suffering is cosmic, woven into everything. God cares about his suffering world. Romans 8, 23 to 26. Please write that down, Romans 8, 23 to 26. And let God in inject some, some courage in you tonight through these words. Some of you right now are suffering and you cannot pray well, if at all. And God so cares about that suffering that the spirit of Jesus Christ is praying for you. That's beautiful. So I want you to see that God is not afraid of the story of suffering. He's not distant right now from you. 
So, so we come back full circle to this question, what, what goal does suffering have? What can suffering accomplish? I need those answers. You need those answers. And so there's a move, guys, that I want to show you. There's a move that certain suffering saints do in the Bible. There's this move. There's this thing that they do with suffering that's so amazing to me. And it took me an intense season of brutal suffering that I went through for God to reveal this move in the scripture to me. And noth nothing has been the same. I have not mastered this, but nothing has been the same. But this move that we're going to see, what these precious saints do with, with, with a suffering situation, allows the suffering to transform the situation into a tool of progress. So you're sitting here tonight and you're suffering... And you're either going, I have no idea what to do with that. And that is okay. We're going to equip you in the word of God tonight. But if you do not know what suffering is trying to accomplish or what to do with it, suffering without purpose is suicide. But if we can find a way to inject purpose in suffering and see what God is doing, the Bible declares that it creates endurance and formation. This is critical. So I'm going to give you one thought tonight. Joshua, throw it up. I beat you to it. This is what I want you to do. This has saved my life, literally. Over and over again. This is the move. The meaning we assign to suffering is critical to our formation. And I'm going to explain what I mean. Write that down. Take a picture of that. Some of you need to walk in this. The meaning we assign to suffering is critical to our formation. If you're suffering tonight or, or a part of your story, maybe when you were even a child, a part of your story is a, is a suffering story. If you have never assigned, if you've never assigned some purpose to it, I promise you, you are in deep pain right now. But I want to equip you to take that suffering story and assign something from the scripture that injects purpose into that pain. So there's meaning behind your story now. And watch what happens to your life. So here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to move very quickly through this. But here's what we're going to do. I want you to see a contrast of responses to suffering between two men in the Bible. Okay? Two men. Not women. Women are tougher than men. Stop that. I'm kidding. I'm going to take Jeremiah, and I'm going to take the Apostle Paul. We're going to do a quick contrast. I'm going to show you how they're both going through very similar suffering stories. It's odd how similar their stories are. And I'm going to watch with you how one responds to suffering versus the other. One throws in the towel in life. The other grins with tears in his eyes. Here we go. Jeremiah and my guy Paul. Once again, one could, one could not attach meaning to his suffering story, and the other did. And the outcome is fantastic. It's, it's staggering. Now, here, here's the similarity, and I'm, I'm aligning the similarity because two very similar stories, but one did not attach purpose to it. The other did with very different outcomes. So think about this just for a minute. Think about our guys. They both had very, very similar encounters with suffering, starting with Jeremiah. After Jeremiah preached to a crowd, the Bible says that a crowd beat Jeremiah and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord, Jeremiah 20, verse 2. Now, let's go to Paul. And Paul, the Bible says, after freeing a demon-possessed girl, the Bible says the crowd joined in attacking Paul, just like Jeremiah, and the magistrates tore the garments off him and gave orders to beat him with rods and threw him into prison. Whew. Acts 16, verses 22 and 23. By the way, they are both sent to not only the Jews, but the, to the Gentiles. They were both set apart from the womb to preach. They were both warned by God that much suffering would come their way. Very similar trajectories. 
Yet these men had radically different responses to their suffering. Look at Jeremiah 20. Go there and look in your phone or whatever you're using tonight. Jeremiah 20. Look at Jeremiah's response. This is terrifying. Jeremiah 20, look at verse 14 if you're there, if you're quick with the Bible. Jeremiah's lament goes like this. Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you. Curse that man. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord destroys. Let him hear a cry in the morning and alarm at noon because he did not kill me in the womb. What? Now, look at Acts 16 and look at Paul's deep response to a very similar story. Acts 16, verse 20, uh, 23. Let's start there. This is crazy. And when they had inflicted many blows upon Paul, Paul and his posse, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison. I don't have time to get into that, but it was not good for our guys. And fastened their feet in the stocks. They're being tortured. And here it comes. Paul's going to say, why was I ever born? No, in verse 25, about midnight, with pain and agony, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. What? What happened? I need to, lock it. I need to unlock that secret. And so I, I, I want to avoid reductionism tonight. I, 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 want to, I want to avoid being oversimplistic. These are two different human beings. I know that. But Jeremiah was a man of great tears and often hopeless if, if you really study his life. Paul seemed to have this amazing endurance and hope in his suffering. And, and I know you're thinking Enneagram right now. Just leave it alone. I, I'm sure they both struggled, guys. Paul wasn't just grinning. I, I'm sure they both struggled. I'm sure they both had very unique stories. But here's what I want you to, to see. I want to give you two examples in which Paul assigns meaning to his suffering, which allowed him to be formed by the suffering, injecting purpose into it. Watch him work. Now, I want you to think about your own life. You, you may have suffered greatly 15, 16, 18 years ago. Maybe it was 10 years ago. And still that suffering has not been assigned purpose. Watch your guy work. This could change your days. Example number one, Philippians chapter one. Let's go there. Example one, Philippians chapter one. Paul is in the stocks again. He's in prison again. Whatever, maybe house arrest. He's not doing well. His calling has been stripped from him. He's, a, he's an eight with a wing seven, okay? <clears throat> you don't put a man like that in a, in a room and lock him down. He's suffering. He's suffering. He's suffering. And I showed you guys this in systematic theology. I'll show you it again. Watch this verse. I sat with this verse in the mountains of California. Don't, yeah, don't ask. As I was going through some of the most intense suffering, I, I sat with one verse in the mountains. One verse. Watch verse 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me. Now look up here. Go ahead and get that alarm. Look at what just happened in that verse. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me. How would you finish that sentence? How have you finished that sentence in your suffering? What has happened to me? Paul assigns something incredible to his suffering. Has really served to advance the gospel. Now, I'm sure he didn't get there overnight. I'm sure it took much lamenting, much prayer and and suffering within community with good people around him speaking truth to him. But Paul found a way to finish that sentence. He, he found a way to attach some great purpose of God to his suffering. And now the suffering is not just pain. It's not just wasted. 
I, I love the language, guys. I love the language of this man. Served. It was under the sovereign control of, of somebody who has the power to control it now. What Paul is saying is it's now serving God. Oh, somebody meant it for evil. Someone hurt me bad. I suffered at the hands of someone. People broke my heart. But Romans 8, 28, God injected himself in that blow. And he's now using it, and it's now serving God's purposes now. I, I came to a place where I finally was able to attach that to my suffering. I attach that purpose to my suffering story now. And if you look at the end of, uh, oh, Paul, I don't want to say Paul's sneaky, because that's, that's not, yeah, that's not good. But look at Philippians 4, verse 21. Here's what he means in parts, I believe. He ends the letter, with, which I almost feel like he's winking. <laughs> he's grinning. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. Oh, in verse 22. Oh, oh, by the way, all the saints greet you, especially those who live with Caesar. You see, we couldn't get the gospel to Caesar. Uh, not with the Praetorian Guard around him. Unless I would suffer greatly at the hands of men, and I would be arrested, and I would have the legal standing to appeal, and I could be brought into Caesar's inner courts, and I could be chained to one of Caesar's Praetorian Guards for six hours at a time. And that's where he got the armor of God analogy, by the way. And I would share the gospel with those Praetorian Guards, and I would win them to Jesus. And they were Caesar's personal bodyguards, and they would take the gospel to Caesar. Oh, oh I'm not just suffering. I finally, finally found a way to attach purpose to my suffering, and now the story looks a whole lot different. The pain is still there. The hurt is still there. But now there's meaning. Whew. My guy's not done. Chapter 1, verse 19. Not only is the gospel moving into Caesar's house through my suffering, yes, I still weep at night, but I see there's a bigger story now. God, God has injected himself in it now. But I love verse 19. He says it's not just the gospel going into Caesar's household, but God is actually using the evil of other people to make me more like the Son of God. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, that's, a, that's an elusive verse right there because very well, I, I agree. He's saying, hey, pray for me. I, I think through your prayers, I'm going to be released from prison. Okay, I accept that. But that word deliverance is a, is a very powerful little word. That, that also can point to refining. Paul may be, maybe, I want to be careful you're not going beyond the text. Paul may be saying this. That through your prayers and the help of the, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out to actually transform who I am. Oh, oh I know you meant it for evil. This is Joseph language now, isn't it? See, I, that's two, two Old Testament references tonight, my friends. It's Joseph saying, you meant it for evil. But God interfered, injected himself in it, and he turned it into good. Yeah, you hurt me. And I weep. And I can't erase that part of my story now. But God has taught me the hard lesson of how to forgive the most wretched of my enemies. God has drawn me closer to Jesus, who had those who was closest to him betray him with a kiss. God is doing things in me through your evil. He is turning your poison into medicine. Do you see what Paul's doing? He's, a, he's assigning purpose to a suffering and recreating the narrative. Now, let me show you another very beautiful... I'll throw this up, Josh, real quick. Here's, here's a great thought. Do I have it up there? Go ahead and click over one. Yeah, ooh, that's good. Um, we can't control most suffering, guys, if any. But we can influence its effect by the meaning we assign to it. That's power. 
Look at the second example of Paul assigning meaning to his suffering, which turned it on his heads. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I love this right here. This is cool. You guys okay? You're not suffering due to my teaching, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> Look at, uh, let's, let's bear through this real quick, and then we're going to turn this over to some prayer and discussion and stuff. Here's what Paul's going to do in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He's going to go like this. God has given me all these revelations, and God called me to the third heaven, like literally the realm of God. God has, uh, God has given me so much power and blessing and favor in this world. It's just been an amazing life. And if I'm just rather honest tonight, it's actually created some pride. That's what Paul is going to say. He says in 12.1, I must go on boasting. That there is nothing to be gained by it. He, he says, I'm just trying to prove a point by my boast, boasting. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I've received great, great visions and revelations. I know a man in Christ. This is Paul speaking of himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Oh, not, not, not the, the air we breathe and not, not the atmosphere above, but the third heaven, God's realm. I was, I was actually called up there, probably when he was stoned, with rocks. <laughs> I felt like I had to qualify that. <laughs> Urban people in Chicago. All right, all right. <laughs> I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I don't know. I don't know what was going on. I just, I just woke up before the throne of God. God knows, verse 3, and I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Abraham bos Abraham's bosom, like before the Lord. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. God, and Paul, you've said that twice now. He's like, this is an experience. Verse 4, and he heard things that cannot be told. Things were revealed to me that I cannot put in, 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 in language. I saw shapes and colors and movements. I, I, I experienced emotion. And there, there are not words to describe my experience. Verse 5, on behalf of this man, I will boast. <laughs> what in the world? But on my own behalf, I will not boast except in my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I, I would be speaking the truth. I could boast that God has done great things with me. But if I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of all the experience God had given me, all the amazing revelations God had graced to me, so I would not become prideful and conceited because of the surpassing greatness of these experiences. A thorn was given to me in the flesh. Oh, what a, what, what a safe translation. A tent peg, a tent peg, back then, you know, a tent peg was driven through my soul. To keep me grounded. Because pride was going to lift me up. Do you know what it was? People say, oh, Paul was blind and all this stuff. It's right there in the text. He says, a thorn was given to me. A, a tent stake was driven. You know, he likens his body to a, his tabernacle. It's a tabernacle. It's a tent. He says, God had to allow this, this, this stake to be driven in me to keep my feet on the ground. I was getting too big. What was it? It was a messenger of Satan. It was a fallen angel. It was a demon. A messenger of Satan to harass me. There was a fallen angel probably taken in the body of a human being. You see this in the book of Acts. Who would follow Paul around just destroying his work. Destroying his reputation. To keep me from becoming conceited. God said, we'll use that. We'll use that deep suffering, Paul. We'll use it. Now, now, Paul didn't understand what was going on. He just had this demon that was like haunting him, was destroying so much of his work and, and, and defaming his name and 
marring his friends and all this stuff. And Paul, Paul couldn't understand the suffering, so he says in verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this. Take it away, Lord, that it should leave me. But then the Lord assigned purpose to the suffering, and it changed the story completely. But God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, I need you broken. I will. Dang. I need you on your face in prayer. And you won't go there the way I need you to unless I allow that suffering. Because when you're on your face, broken and surrendered, that's when I can truly unleash my power. That's when I work through you. And it's like Paul had this epiphany, right? He had this moment where he's like, oh, my soul. I'm not just suffering. I can now attach a great purpose to my suffering. It hurts. I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go through this. But now I see what God's doing in it. He's rewritten that narrative, that chapter in my life. And now I can go on. So he says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon. What a transformation in this man. And I don't know Jeremiah's story, but you cannot find this in Jeremiah's story. So here's what I'm going to say. We're, we're, we're going to wrap it up. This is just so moving to me, man. God allows suffering. And then he injects purpose into it. Oftentimes, because there aren't other ways to form certain parts of us. But there's something about deep pain, deep suffering that we go through, and then God coming into that story and saying, okay, I know there's scars there. But I want to take that, that deep suffering, and I want to reveal to you and attach a great purpose to it. And it's going to hurt for the rest of your days, but not quite like it used to. We're going to redeem that suffering. And we're going to put power in your hands to use it for good. There is a lady who goes to near north who was a stripper in Chicago who's gone through hell and back like 17 times. Never understood her suffering story. All the things that people had done to that poor soul. She comes to Jesus, she gets saved, and God reveals to her how to attach purpose to that, that suffering. And she has now birthed a ministry where she understands the wounded brokenness of those precious women who are in these clubs. And she now uses that suffering to connect to their hearts and bring them to Jesus. The suffering has not disappeared. She weeps. But it's not purposeless anymore. It's awakened an energy and a purpose for her life now. And that's what God is trying to do. So here's the process, and I hate to call it a process because this is just so much more attaching meaning to our suffering. When I look back at my own life and the brutal things I've had to go through, first of all, God could have stopped the suffering, but instead he chose to enter into it with me. 
Secondly, God entered into my suffering to use it f to form me. Thirdly, I have to work with the suffering experience. I've got to start moving with it and not running away from it. I have to work with the suffering experienced by attaching meaning to it. What is God doing in me and through me with the suffering? And fourthly, the suffering experience begins to take on new meaning when I work with it and let God form me through it. It is not that easy. I am not always that clean with it. But that's, that's the movement of being formed by our suffering. So I know that that raises all kinds of questions in our hearts. And there's a time, there's a time to answer that. But, but I wonder if we could just kind of wrap this, this great journey that Rafe and I have been on with you. With this thought that if this is a part of your story, part of your chapter of, of, of your life, that you would love to, to forget about or erase or do something with. I wonder, and I would pray it would be done in community. I wonder if you can start a new journey by saying, it's going to be hard, but I wonder if I can look at that chapter of suffering afresh. And like Paul, begin to try to make sense of attaching some great purpose from God to it. And begin to redeem it. I don't want to live as a broken victim. I want to live as someone who's transparent about their broken story and their suffering, but I see now that God wants to empower me to use this for good. And if you say, Pastor John, that was awesome, but that's totally unfair and I kind of hate you right now. You know what's crazy, guys? This is the gospel. This is the cross. God displayed this for us. So I was thinking about you guys, and I was thinking about my own life, and, and I wanted to give you one last challenge, homework. And Josh, if you could just throw this up. Uh, I just think this would be so healing and maybe so powerful. But if you have suffered or are suffering, I want you to write a lament. You say, what is a lament? That sounds dreary. It's like a country music song. I'm just kidding. Maybe not. I want, I, seriously, I want, I want you to write a lament. A lament is crisis language. You read it all through the Psalms. It's crisis language. Some of the Psalms you read and you flinch. You're like, was that inspired by the Holy Spirit? What is going on right there? Like, kill them all, Lord. You know, you're just like, what? Precatory Psalms, you know, and all that. But what it is, is it is the, the vulnerability of Scripture and the transparency of Scripture of watching a suffering soul cry out to God, and we must see it. I, I just want to challenge you to write the suffering you're experiencing in the rawest form you can, which means you may not want to even share this with anybody. And again, if you read some of the Psalms, I mean, they're just, they're flat out wild. Like, there's, like, anger in these songs, Gangster rap. But I, I just want to challenge you to write the suffering you're experiencing. And I'm not talking about writing a song or whatever, unless that's a channel that the Holy Spirit works through. It's like poetry. But I want you to write down, and this may, this may take a lot of prayer first because you don't want to go in, into your past. I get it. But just write it down in the rawest form you can. Pour out your heart to God on paper. There's something about that transfer from heart to physical action like writing that does something to us. Pour out your heart to God on paper. But I don't want you to stop there. With this lament that you write, I want you to end the lament by assigning some meaning to your suffering. And if you can get that far, man, I pray that that experience and even praying over what you put on paper would, be, would, would begin to renew and rebirth your story and be a part of the, the healing and the meaning of the deepest soul pain of suffering. 
And I know that this is going to do crazy things to you guys. I know it will transform you. Say, how do you know that, Pastor John? Because I've done it over and over again. It's been the healing balm to my soul. Amen?